that's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Last Christmas, which opens November 8th, uh, courtesy of Universals, uh, and directed by Paul Feig. And so he became notable for directing Bridesmaids? Yeah, Bridesmaids was, uh, he had done some film work before that, but Bridesmaids in 2011 was his big break, of course, and, uh, and then a succession of Melissa McCarthy films followed up through the uh, unfortunate uh, demise of the female-led Ghostbusters film in 2016, and after that he seems to have um, gone a little bit haywire between this film and uh, A Simple Favor, which, you know, I found A Simple Favor very enjoyable, just very kind of like, what the fuck are they think, what do they think they're doing, and... <laughs> so last Christmas... I think we're still both reeling from... Yeah, when we left the screening, I felt... I think I was I speechless. felt attacked. <laughs> uh, this film has everything. Literally everything. I think for, first I want to say that it has lovely sentiments um, and I was impressed, we'll start, uh, start off on a positive note, I, w I was impressed by the level of inclusivity uh, regarding uh, various uh, sexual orientations, different Gender identities, race, yeah, um, different, all kinds of different combinations of people coming together in very intriguing ways that aren't commented upon because they don't need to be. But um, yeah, yes, I also think the film um, looks really nice. Um, I although thought, you commented, it looks like the Grove. I Christmas. thought it looked like the Grove, <laughs> but as a native Los Angelino, to me, Christmas is. Um, holiday time at the Grove, so that's what this movie looks like. But it, but I it, thought it was beautiful. But it's set in London, and on, yes. on streets that look like you could you could ostensibly eat a meal off of them. Uh, anyway, this movie is about a 26-year-old woman who I thought... <laughs> when she said her age, I laughed because I thought she looked older. But a 26-year-old woman played by... Amelia Clark, uh, who is... Daenerys in Game of Thrones, which I'm not familiar with, but and she's also in the Star Wars universe. She was in she is a Solo story, the Han Solo, which was not a good movie. No. Anyway, so Amelia Clark. Amelia Clark. She plays this like sort of like Katarina, a Yugoslavian, um, a woman who migrated to the UK from Yugoslavia. Mm -hmm. She seems to be um, having a hard time sort of like getting her footing. She works at like a year-round Christmas store. Run by Michelle Yeoh. And her life kind of gets, not turned upside down, but she kind of gets a chance meeting with like a handsome stranger kind of mm -hmm. leads her to change her ways. Played by Henry Golding. For the better. And Henry Golding. Golding is known from Crazy Rich Asians. And A Simple Favor. And A Simple Favor. So the story seems very appropriate for like a holiday film. And it's called Last Christmas. And maybe we should say like there will be significant spoilers from here on out. There are always spoilers, but yeah, this is going to be a, a big one. Um, so the film is not... I don't even know where to start. Okay, so... <laughs> because there are so many things in this movie. So for some inane reason, um, George Michael's catalog bolsters... Uh, oh, that's the other good thing about this movie is um, George Michael's music. Yes. Like, just simply his music. It really doesn't tie into the movie at all. So Katarina, a.k.a. Kate. So she... Last Christmas, the, the Christmas before the present one, she had a heart transplant and she has not been able to recover her former identity because of that. Uh, but she wants to be a singer, she's obsessed with George Michael even so, though like time-wise that doesn't make any damn sense. And um, uh, learns that she, she falls in love with this man played by Henry Golding who it turns out is a ghost. Uh, as is immediately apparent based on all his suspect, uh, suspicious actions, and falls in love with him, only to learn that it's his heart that she had received, and she needs to uh, learn how to enjoy life and, um, you know, buck up. Uh. 
We don't have enough time to really like break this movie down, but I think we should run down the list of all the things in it. So she has a heart transplant. No, no, it starts out in 1999 Yugoslavia, the former Yugoslavia. So her parents, uh, played by Emma Thompson. So Emma Thompson and actor Greg Wise came up with a story for what this is based on. And Emma Thompson is here playing uh, a Serbian, uh, basically, who's kind of ignorant about social customs still, even though they've been living nearly 20 years in London. Whose portrayal of this woman made me uncomfortable. It's a little caricature-y. It's the equivalent of, I don't know what you would call white people playing other types of white people, but it, like what, whatever that version of blackface is, that's how I felt watching her play that character. Mm -hmm. Because it's like, it's, it's a caricature that's like uncomfortably like funny in a bad way. Well, especially because the actor playing her husband is uh, from Yugoslavia. Okay, so then there's that happening. Then um, Kate Katarina's sister is a closeted lesbian mm -hmm. who's like in a relationship with a black woman <laughs> and doesn't want to tell her parents. Uh, her boss... Played by Michelle Yeoh. Who, you know, Michelle Yeoh is quite entertaining in this, I thought. There's also a, sort of like a love story between her and this really like awkward awkward stranger sauerkraut salesman yes um who pursues her she also makes some comments that are like these stereotypical comments that i like, like she makes these blanket statements for humor's sake that i found to feel date i found them dated um oh there's so many things she wants to be a singer so she goes on two auditions uh <sighs> Oh, oh my god, there, but, but there's more. There's like, there's, there's she class, volunteers. There's, there's class issues. They're trying to tackle Brexit. They're trying to tackle... Yeah, the, yeah, they're tackling immigration issues. She works for like a homeless shelter. And then there's some issue with like them feeling like she's just another middle class person who wants to do like one good thing a year. Really like, we were on the way back home from the screening trying to think of like what they didn't throw into this movie abortion abortion, they, they abortion. and religion yeah but every other topic you can think of <laughs> is thrown into this film anyway my biggest issue with it is it's like, oh and patty lupone as patty lupone is in it for like one scene a ridiculous nonsensical scene as a customer who can't decide which effigy of baby jesus to buy right Wow, just like, so George Michael's catalog deserves a better vehicle than this. It really plays no, like, part in the story, except that this character says she's obsessed with George Michael, but it's not explained why. Her age doesn't really, um, it, it doesn't make sense that she would be obsessed with him. So I felt like we needed some explanation. Also, the movie just seemed, and I, like I said after we left the screening, you know, maybe upon a rewatch and further analyzation, it, it might make sense that the songs that were analysis. chosen... Uh, analysis. Sorry. Okay, Reby. Sorry. <laughs> upon, centipede! Upon further analysis, um, it might make sense that the songs match up with whatever, like the lyrical content. But just on a first watch, the, the music doesn't seem to match what's happening necessarily. Mm -hmm. And there's even a scene where like characters are singing a song that isn't a George Michael song, but instead it. of us hearing them sing, we watch them like lip sync whatever they're singing with George Michael playing over it. So it, it almost felt like whoever made this film was like, I bought these songs, I'm going to throw them in there. But then well, that very last song as the credits roll is not a George Michael it's, song. It, but it's almost like Emma Thompson and her co-writer listened to, were listening to Last Christmas by George Michael and thought, what a weird, like, using those lyrics made up this silly story. Because if you think about it, the title is very morbid, considering, and I love a good morbid Christmas movie. But at the, the grand denouement, uh, in the finale of this film, where you're supposed to feel its emotional punch, like, what I wanted was Frank Capra's It's a Wonderful Life, which, you know, I cry every time I see that film, when the townspeople get together and give Jimmy Stewart the money he needs. Uh, this, nothing, no. Mm -hmm. I get emotional in films very easily where I will like well up and n not even close not even close at any <laughs> point in this film it's so ridiculous she's such an unlikable Katarina is such an unlikable she character is. She is. but not bad enough that because it's very obvious right away that like 
the like the male lead is, is a ghost. Mm -hmm. It was very obvious. And I kind of felt like, oh, this is going to be like a Christmas carol and she's going to be like Scrooge. But she's not a despicable person. No, not at she's all. Just she's just a just fucking a loser, but not in like a way that I think she needs to be redeemed or she needs to find like a better path. She's just kind of a loser. And she just seems like any other 26 year old, like living in a big city, kind of listless. And but but then she uses her medical condition, which they like dr drag us like like they keep us waiting for so long in suspense of what kind of illness in suspense of what is wrong with her and then and when she says it she's like i don't tell people about my heart transplant because they treat me differently like is that a thing I that think, doesn't seem like i think the thing. reveal should have been it was mental health trauma but the first time <laughs> heard that hair and how she's acting and oh this poor movie i, I, I did, yeah, and like halfway through it i'm like i can't decide if i want to give it props for being so fucking offbeat kind of like a simple favor which well but a simple favor i was on board for most of it because blake lively is captivating yeah to me she's gorgeous she just she's captivating and i, I thought anna kendrick did a lot of heavy lifting in that compared to how what she normally does i thought yeah. she did like i was impressed so i think those characters were captivating enough that all the weirdness and the overly complicated plot was bearable but in this it's just oh my god what did you call it a poo poo platter of wait a, a a porridge of undercooked ideas yeah and just all this shit thrown in together but in some of it's like i you know the, i looked up the actress uh rebecca root who plays the doctor who's trans and like the the, the level of represent representation is really nice to see it's impressive yes. um across the board but Oh, it just goes off a cliff. Like you know, the way this screenplay uh, panned out, I feel like it might have been better as like a mini series. Well, like Love Actually. I don't recall that film, but I. But like a series of vignettes. Or 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 like Tales from the City, like something like that, where there's just so many things happening that maybe had they had multiple. Um, installments so, to figure you know, it out. Emma Thompson has two Oscars, one for acting, one for writing, because she adapted Jane Austen's Sense and Sensibility. But her last project I remember that she wrote was A Labor of Love. It was Effie Gray, and it was kind of mishandled and didn't really go anywhere. So I think this was maybe her attempt to write something mainstream, but also have some subtext, like but lots and lots of all kinds of juxtaposed subtext that make it i also feel like the main character katarina feels like what perhaps like a privileged person would she reads or is that character just seems like whoever wrote it doesn't know what like people that age because even the, I, I think they're trying to portray her as kind of being slutty yeah and i don't think she's I think her behavior is very normal for someone her age. Like, we see her go home with two different guys for like a one night stand. And then try to fuck a ghost. And then she tries to fuck the ghost. But, uh, yeah, it just seems very like corny. So, and, and also the, the heart transplant twist is bit, immediately I thought of um, Untamed Heart with Marissa Tomei and I think Christian Slater from the early 90s. And then. Uh, Bonnie Hunt directed a movie with David Duchovny in Mini Driver where he falls in love with a woman that gets his heart, his wife's, his dead wife's heart, Return to Me, okay. in 2000 or the early 2000s. Like, there's, no, there's nothing innately... Mm. I have a lot m more thoughts on how this could have been better, but this review's too long already. Um, I would give this film one out of five stars. <sighs> yeah, unfortunately, I, yeah. I, I have to agree. But if you like George Michael, um, you can find his music on iTunes. Go watch Keanu. Um, the Essentials Mix has all of the songs that were featured in this film. I would just listen to that playlist. The closing credits aren't even a George Michael song. No. But I would say just rewatch Keanu, which Keegan Michael Key at least gets that hallucinatory uh, re examination. Or, what, what, the, or, or go on YouTube, uh, you're on YouTube now, like just look up like a George Michael mix and watch his videos because that would be more entertaining to watch this movie. <laughs> anyway, that's all I have. Yeah, same. Okay, bye. Right, bye.